Hi, I'm City Manager Ed Augustus and welcome to another edition of How Worcester Works. Uh, this time we're at the Worcester Police Department and we're in the city's real-time crime center. Uh, and I'm joined by Captain Paul Saucio, who's in charge of the Real-Time Crime Center. Captain, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, if you could tell our viewers, what is the Real-Time Crime Center and how does it support the work of the Worcester Police Department? The Real-Time Crime Center utilizes the latest technology to be more efficient. We have roughly uh, 1,500 cameras in the city that we use for investigations concerning drug activity, um, where we can view things live and enable the police to identify suspects. These cameras are also used for long-term investigations after the fact to identify suspects or at the same time where you may have somebody that you thought was a suspect, it can eliminate people. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of different things going on in here as far as cameras. We have shot spotter. We have license plate reader technology. We also utilize social media monitoring technology that's an open source that the public um, sends different, different messages. We can use that during large scale events to help get our officers in, in the places they need it at the times they need it best. Mm -hmm. So this really helps us. Obviously, we could never have enough police officers to be in every corner of the city at any given time. So this really helps us kind of extend the reach of the Worcester Police Department. Uh, you know, when something happens to figure out, you know, who might be a suspect or, as you mentioned, who is not a suspect. Correct. And what we do is once when people are in here monitoring this, there's, the police radio is going on, and if they pick up a call and we know we have cameras in that area, they'll immediately place the cameras in the location to support the operations officer on the street. Mm -hmm. And we can call them right from here and let them know that this may be happening or for something to look for. So that's a critical thing in terms of helping the officers, you know, safety. If there's something going on that they might not be able to be aware of a block away, that you have the camera capability to kind of keep in communication with them what's going on or suspect is in a different area. Correct. In an example, when the Trump rally was in town, um, somebody called in a suspicious package. We were able to actually go back into the video and see where that package was. We could then give ground intelligence to the units responding, give them a description of it, all based from this room, or um, most of the investigators in the building have iPads, iPhones. Mm -hmm. They can actually look at the cameras right from those devices mm -hmm. and not even have to be here. That's great. And in that case, thankfully, nothing came of that. But if there had been something there, that would provide you with evidence to bring to the district attorney, I assume, and potentially help make the case in court that a particular individual left the package uh, at that location. Correct. Nowadays, when you go to court, everybody watches the CSI shows and they all believe that all this evidence is going to be there. And by having video, it actually helps establish our case a lot more clear than mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about 1,500 cameras, are those 1,500 uh, cameras that are pre-deployed that are permanent cameras or is there a combination of cameras that you might put up because there's a particular concern in a neighborhood or a location as well as permanent cameras? Most of the cameras are permanent and we also are working with the housing authority. We have access to their cameras. Um, we also have the ability to put up our own cameras. So for an example, during the St. Patrick's Day Parade, large scale event, over 100,000 people, we established the Real-Time Crime Center as our command post. A week ahead of time, we put up additional cameras so that we could actually view the whole route. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we could take photographs from those cameras and email commanders in the field if there was a problem so that it could identify people. And one of the things the city's trying to do to kind of expand the capability of the police department is as we do uh, park rehab projects, We've made it a priority to install camera capability in the parks so that, you know, you can have that additional kind of presence in the parks, even if it's not an officer full-time, it's the full-time kind of capabilities of a camera. And I think that really helped us in one case this past summer at University Park. Yes, that actually helped solve a homicide where we would not have had 
pretty much any other evidence going into it mm -hmm. besides that. And it's also used, again, City Hall, the officers work in the footbeats. They have access to these cameras on their phones. So if they're looking at some suspicious drug activity, they can actually step back, watch it on the video, and then move in and make an arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we're looking at here is pretty much the City Hall area, the common area. Uh, and with the addition of these cameras and then the foot patrol, it's made a, a huge difference. Anybody who comes down to the common now uh, versus four or five months ago will just see the difference in terms of you know, how clean it is and the, some of the activity that we were dealing with previously has really been kind of removed from the common and the downtown area. It's made a big difference. Um, when you when we talk about the cameras, we have something called a camera collaborative. Uh, so there are businesses or homeowners within the city who have their own camera system on their business or their residence, uh, and they can work with the Worcester Police Department as part of this camera collaborative. Could you just explain how that works? Sure. During the summer, during our footbeats and the summer impact, we wanted to go door to door and visit people, give them information on the camera collaborative, which is basically if you have private cameras. You can register those with the police department. And that will enable us to create a map. So if we have an incident, we could pull up that map and know that, you know, 123 Main Street has cameras, the locations, directions they're pointing, and then contact information. So if something were to occur at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, we can then contact the people who signed up and they can assist the police department by giving us access to those cameras. Mm -hmm. Some people have even gone so far as to give us their IP address and password and we can monitor live their cameras. That's great. But how many, uh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, how many folks have joined the camera collaborative? Several hundred, and matter of fact, we had so many people um, interested in the beginning and in this unit we have two full-time officers but we also utilize interns. The interns, their whole job was trying to sign people up. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to do that again this year and, and keep it moving on. That's great. And so if anybody's watching this show that has a camera on their business or their home or maybe their church or civic organization uh, and would like to join the Camera Collaborative, they could let us know and contact us. I think we'll provide the number uh, you know, on the graphic so that more people can join in because if you think about it, it, it really adds to the efficiency of the police department because previously you probably had to go have officers go door to door to figure out who had a camera uh, and then track it down that that way now you can go right to the folks in the area that you know have the camera that is of the location you're looking for. And a good thing out of this program is you know the Worcester Police try to be as transparent as possible we've created our own police app uh, Worcester PD Mobile where users can download that for free from Apple or Android. And it's basically a free app that gives you access to a scanner, to maps of your actual neighborhood, and you can have an alert. So if a, a B and E occurs in your neighborhood, you could be alerted to that fact. Hmm. Well, after you're alerted to that, you could say, oh, well, my cameras may have caught something. Review your footage, contact the police, and again, help us solve crime because we cannot do it alone. Right. So, you know, the police has the crime mapping technology, and that's where the camera collaborative comes through, and that's crimereports.com. And, and that really is a critical point that the Worcester Police Department can't do it alone, that it's a, it's a partnership between our citizens and the police department, and you really rely on them because they're living 24-7 in their neighborhood or their place of business, and so they're going to see things and know what's normal and what's not normal who's normally in the neighborhood or not normally in the neighborhood. And that information is invaluable to you all to do the job of keeping our city safe. Correct. We cannot do the job without the help of the public. That's a matter of fact. And, and you all have been really aggressive, I think, over the last 10 years to create these community uh, watch programs uh, where offices who are in that particular area meet on a monthly basis with residents and just you know, talk through issues, things they're seeing, trends they're seeing, uh, and it really has created a great relationship between our neighborhoods and our citizens and the police department. And it's interesting you say that because the idea for the crime mapping came from a crime watch group. Oh, I was at a, at a meeting and someone was saying, you know, cruises were in our neighborhood the other night, I don't know what's going on, and it just got us to think, well, maybe there's something out there that can help us. 
and then Chief Jem was on board with it, said go ahead, research it and do it, and that's how that came about. That's great. So it's not only just sharing information, but also sometimes giving us some good ideas that we can follow up on. Exactly, and yeah. you know that also led to our um, text-to-tip program, which is widely used. We get thousands of tips from shoplifting to homicides. Wow. Wow. So it's a, it's a great program. That's great. So now we talked a bit about the cameras, but we also have the shot spotter technology. Yes. And that technology is kind of part of the real-time crime center. I know people might have heard about it. It's gotten a fair amount of press, but I don't think people have had a chance to actually see it in operation. So this might be kind of interesting to people. Could you kind of explain how it works? Yes, um, shot spot is a gun, gun detection technology that utilizes sensors that are placed throughout the city. And when a gunshot goes off, the sound waves that come through the barrel resonate out into the neighborhood and it's captured by these sensors. Once three or more sensors capture that sound wave, it triangulates it, it sends that signal to California where actual people listen to that they also pick up the algorithm and they make a decision whether or not it's an actual gunshot. That information is then transferred back to the Worcester Police Dispatch and dispatch makes the call to the officers in the, in the cars. But at the same time, everybody that has a smart device also gets this alert on their phones, iPads, or in their cruiser in the laptop. And this whole scenario takes approximately a minute, which is amazing because normally, you know, in the past, if someone were to hear a gunshot, only 20 to 25 percent of the time are those people actually calling it in because they don't realize what they're hearing mm -hmm. or they're too afraid to call it in. Mm -hmm. So we were not capturing data of where all these gunshots were occurring. Now we have this map show up with the dot. Within that dot will be a 25 meter area, and if you can see the radius of that circle, that's 25 meters. So from within that circle is where the actual shot happened. And I hear dispatch all the time, officers will be responding to the call, and they'll say, you know, go to the right side of that house, almost in the backyard in the driveway. Dispatch can direct officers to where the shots are coming wow. from. And the other uh, thing about this is, as far as an officer's safety perspective, the officer can listen to it. If, if Would you like to hear one right yeah, now? Yeah, that'd be great. Brian, if you can... Uh... Now, you get this call, it's two o'clock in the morning, comes into you, you listen to this, you know you're going to a gunshot, it's not a car backfire. Mm -hmm. So that gives you, um, more in the area of tactical response on how you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. You could call your partner and say, you know, you take this street, I'm going to take this street. This is a live event and they can respond more safely instead of just driving into a neighborhood looking where they have no idea where they're going. Right, right. Basically spotting a you know, flashlight to see if there's a person there. Yeah. Whereas now they do an actual search of the area where we recover if there is no person. We will recover um, shell casings, and those shell casings are later analyzed, and we try to match those shell casings to other shootings or to other weapons. So it's incredible. So it has multiple purposes. One, obviously, being making sure the offices are, understand what they're going into, potentially, so that they go in with the right number of offices and with the right tactical approach to yes. uh, the situation but also the ability to retrieve evidence. Um, I would think when you get, when people do call, and you said a lot of folks may not call, whether they're afraid or don't know what they heard, um, but when they do call, you could have gotten them from multiple different areas, and you could spend a lot of time looking in areas where nothing happened, uh, as opposed to going to a place maybe where there's a victim, uh, or an opportunity to grab a suspect, or at least the evidence. So that efficiency of the police response is really critical. Correct. It, it's a lot more efficient response. And in the same time, when you look at the number of times people do not call, so if you say that only 25% of the calls that came in, the police wouldn't be there for that shooting or shots fired call. Now, if you are, say, an elderly person in your house and you hear shots fired, you're probably not going to call. 
but you would love to see the police riding by a minute later, yeah. giving you that comfort that the police are actually responding even if nobody did call. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And so these sensors, where are they located? Is it throughout the entire city or is it particular areas of the city? Uh, how, how does that work? Right now, when, when we started this program, we um, signed up for six square miles of coverage. And three, three of those miles are on the west side and three is on the east side. We were fortunate enough that through the CSX mitigation fund, they actually paid for three miles for three years, mm -hmm. which was huge. Um, we've been in operation now since April 6, 2014, so that third year is coming to an end next April. Right. Um, but the sensors themselves are strategically placed within those six square miles based on the best percentage of being able to triangulate those gunshots. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot to do with buildings and topography mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we've made the commitment as a city that even after that CSX money runs out, that the city is going to put into our budget the dollars necessary to continue the program uh, because it really is critical in terms of office of safety and the efficiency of the response. Uh, capabilities for the police department and the opportunity to, you know, let our citizens know that we're using every technology available to us to try to keep our community safe. Correct. And, you know, again, looking at that 25 percent, if somebody was shot and we were never called, you could find them the next day. Yeah. Whereas now, with this technology, you may be able to save people that are being shot mm -hmm. because now you know within that 25 meters of where it's coming Where you're from. looking for. Uh, and I think the last piece of technology that you talked about is the license plate readers. Yes. Uh, so how does that work? Where are the cameras for that? Um, how long do you keep those images of, of the license plates? We, we utilize this technology for major crimes. We're not interested in the person without a license or the registration is, is inactive. Um, we only use it for major crimes. It's been very instrumental in uh, we had a double hit and run vehicular homicide. We had the actual car going through the intersection with the plate reader that assisted us in making an arrest. Um, we've used it in shooting inf investigations. It can also be utilized when we're, if an amber alert comes out. So if an amber alert came out for that plate right there, 49 <laughs> we could actually put that in the system. And if the car drives through, one of these points that has the technology, it will email and text alert the investigators to let them know that car just went through that intersection. So that's, that's huge. So, and how many of these license plate readers do we have in the city? Uh, two stationary, uh -huh. and we also have one in a vehicle uh -huh. that's revolving. Yeah. Um, actually, three stationary. Okay. And so if, if there's a APB for a particular suspect, or like you say, an Amber Alert, you would key in the license plate in question, and then it, it's like having police officers 24-7 at various intersections in the city, um, but much more efficient uh, to capture that and capture the image of who's in the car, or certainly if it was an amber alert if the child mm -hmm. were in the car as well, uh, and get that almost real-time information. Right, and another important point to make is this system just it picks up the plate and a photograph of the car it does not generate any identifying information in relation to who is driving that car, okay. who it's registered to. If I want to look up that car, I have to actually go on to the state system and punch that in myself and come up with that information. Okay. So people's information isn't just you know, being generated and, and, and kept. This technology, we keep it for 60 days because sometimes crimes occur that we're not aware of mm -hmm. for a while, so we want to be able to go back Again, it can validate people's stories. If the person tells me he drove through a certain intersection, well, I can pretty much guarantee whether or not he did or not yep. based on this. And so that, that's an important point because I know people are always concerned about their privacy. So the idea that we're not storing this information in perpetuity, Correct. but it's a 60-day kind of window of time that we do store it. Uh, and it has particular control, so n any officer or employee of the city can't just come in and search that. No. Uh, you have certain kind of protocols that limit who has access to that kind of information. Maybe you could just touch on right. that. Right. 
I would say less than five people right now that can actually view this. Mm -hmm. And when a request comes in from, say, operations uh, patrol, that they want to look at something, it comes in through this office. We have a policy written. An incident number has to be drawn. So you can't just say, you know, I want to see where so-and-so, if he went through that the other day. Yep. It actually has to be a crime incident, and that's part of our policy. And there's, there's a log of who has accessed that information and when. Yes. Uh, so that if there's ever an issue, there's some accountability mechanism. It's set up there. through technical services, so when you log into the system, it's saying you are actually on that program. Mm -hmm. this, this is incredible. So how long has the Real-Time Crime Center as a physical entity existed here in the Worcester Police Department? We're going into our second year now. We still have a few more things to do. I'd say we're about 95% uh -huh. um, complete. But every year, technology changes. You know, this year we bought some new software, and, and you just have to be able to keep up with what's going on out there. Yeah. That really is the challenge. Technology is changing so fast, yes. and not only keeping up with it, but financially being able to keep up with it. Uh, but you look at some of these pieces of technology, it, it really does, it, it is cost efficient if you think about it. The number of offices you'd need to give you the kind of coverage or capability, you could probably never afford to hire as many folks as you'd need to have all of this uh, visual capability within the city. Right, and you know, just getting back to ShotSpot, I mean, a lot of that technology is around schools. And there was a time when we had shots fired down on Murray Ave, and we were able to do a soft lockdown of that school mm -hmm. based on ShotSpot. And it was about time that kids were going to be leaving school. So just having that in the minds of people that it is a, a, a safety measure by having that. Because like you said, the police can't be everywhere. Sometimes people are not going to cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. So we have to find ways to use what's available to help us. And that, that's a really interesting point, too. It's the idea of maybe preventing additional crimes, like near a school, not having kids come out if there's an incident going on in that area, being able to potentially keep people away from a situation until the police are able to respond and, right. and deal with whatever's going on. Right. And again, this, this um, room is used as a command post. Every major thing that happens in the city, this is staffed. And like I said, we put up our own um, cameras when we need to, but we deter criminal activity by mentioning that in the media, mm -hmm. that we are out there. Uh, again, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, I have 10 gang unit officers in their gang unit uniforms walking about the crowd, and we can identify people from here mm -hmm. and let them know that we are out there to keep it safe for everyone. I think that's a huge kind of sense of uh, relief that people have. Sometimes, you know, you go into big crowded situations or you have your kids in that situation. The idea that there's a police presence there, whether you see it or not, that can kind of keep an eye on anybody who shouldn't be there or might have some kind of harmful intention. Uh, I think that reassures people that they can come out and enjoy the great things like the, the parade or I know we've had presidential visits, things of that nature that bring out a lot of crowds and stuff, but also can create dangerous situations. Uh, and so the idea that we have that capability here in the city of Worcester, I think, is, is hopefully good news to our citizens. How, do, how does this compare to other departments? Are we still kind of aspiring to be where other departments are? Are we leading the pack? Are we kind of where many departments our size are? How would you size this In my this opinion, up? we're leading the pack. Um, you know, prior to having all this brought in here, we researched Boston, we went out to their brick uh, you know, and, and looked at things they had. And at the time, Boston had six square miles of shot spot, the same as Whistler. Hmm. Um, and as far as just this room and the way we operate in here, this is the best technology right now. Mm -hmm. Again, it will change, but we're gonna, you know, we're driven to keep up with what's going on. And we've got good people in here who work hard mm -hmm. and they're constantly looking for the next step to get the leverage up. Yeah. So we're, we're kind of setting the pace in terms of using technology uh, in our police work. And as you mentioned at the beginning, this really is a, a citywide effort. So technical services, the Parks Department, Department of Public Works, 
all the other facets of city government are working in concert with the police department to make sure we have these capabilities to, to put the cameras and the other equipment out. And yeah, everybody's been a great help. Yep. Again, you can't do it alone. You, yep. know, you need the other city services to, to help you. Well, now we're going to actually see it from the officer's perspective. So we're going to go take a ride along uh, and see how this technology supports the officer out on the street doing their job day in and day out. Hey, Tom, can you take a swing by uh, 700 Main Street, move along that guy in the chair? Yeah, bring another car with you. He gave the last half guys a real hard time the other night. Yeah, I gotta clear him out, Lieutenant. Like, literally, five minutes ago, ten minutes ago, I cleared him out. Yeah, he's sitting on a uh, kitchen chair in front of the business. All right, can we just uh, take, take a look at that, Tom, please? But this is the shot spotter. Uh, this was one on the 26th from Vernon Street. And this is what we have in the compute in the car yeah. that the root officers have. So now if something came in and it was in your area, you'd get an email or something that I'd get an email on my phone and this would pop up on the screen. Okay. And it wouldn't be the area anywhere in the entire city. So you, everybody gets everything? Yes. And then you, obviously you respond to what is within your area or whatever. Yes, like the 48 Vernon Street, I wouldn't necessarily go there, but I would switch my radio over to that channel yeah. so I can monitor in case anyone's seen, anyone been in the area or any cars were seen leaving the area. Now, so say something comes in, there's a shot, Piedmont Street, yep. right now. Do you, do you um, coordinate the response to that? Who's, who's in charge of trying to figure out tactically how you're going to approach the situation? Is that you or somebody else? Normally would fall to the sergeant on, who is monitoring that side of the city. Uh -huh. And also the, the root officers. We have a terrific training program. And we basically know how to respond to these certain things. Yeah. If one officer calls out, I'm going to go here. Another officer knows out, knows where he should be in relation to him. Yeah. But it's a tremendous tool. It, it, it keeps officers safe. It, yeah, yeah. It's really beneficial. Now, does, does, has everybody kind of embraced it, or are there people who, you know, are skeptical about it, or...? Uh, every police officer I've spoken to is, is happy with the system. Yeah. It eliminates, for the most part, false calls. Okay, yeah. And, unfortunately, with a lot of false calls and uh, gunshots that are unfounded, Officers may tend to let their guard down when they go into the same yeah, yeah. call and it ends up being fireworks. Uh, with this system, we know that it, were, it was, that there were actual gunshots and that we should be responding tactically yeah. and it keeps it keeps more people safe. Yep. Now what, are, so Mrs. Smith calls and says, I think I heard a gunshot. So shot spotter, you know, sends and says, no, it was a backfire, whatever it was. How do we close the loop with Mrs. Smith that, no, don't worry, it wasn't a, wasn't a gunshot, it was whatever? That's normally handled in communications because they would be the first ones to get the notice that it was not an actual gunshot, yeah. that uh, it would be a backfire or whatever else it would be, and they would l notify that person over the phone, just call them back. Yeah. So we it, definitely close the loop with the citizens, especially to let them know, no, nothing to worry about, it yes. wasn't a shot. Yeah. Yes, the persons that called it in, if they leave contact information, we can get back to them. We absolutely re let them know that it was not a gunshot. Yeah. That way, you know, when they don't see an officer rolling up in the neighborhood, they don't think we blew them off. They, right, exactly. Yeah. And with this system, we have the audio. Even if there is a question, people may call it in as fireworks. Yeah. But with this system, we can listen to the listen to the audio, and you can tell right away 
that it was an actual gunshot, the number of gunshots. Yeah. Now, it's not as fine-tuned that you could know the caliber of the shot. Uh, I believe, not right away, but I believe with their investigations, they've been able to tell if there is more than one shot, one type of weapon fired, different types of weapons uh -huh. fired. Because that could be, I mean, think about evidence, like being able to discern the caliber, I would think that would be a huge help if, if, you, if there's a way, audible way to, to do that. Recently we had an incident where two males were reportedly shooting each other and after reviewing the shot spotter it was obvious that only one male was shooting and the person who said he was being shot at was actually being untruthful. So he just claiming it or was he the shooter? He claimed that he was shooting at someone else but after after his, his statement, and they were able to review the shot spotter audio uh -huh. and the type of weapon that was recovered, they realized that he was not being truthful and that he was the actual shooter and he was not okay. being He was shooting, yeah. He was not I mean, being yeah. chased. So all these images are displayed through this uh, main console where we have, I believe, six to eight different computers where we can put those images on this board and the table itself actually has two different ports so we can actually be doing people could be monitoring cameras on one side someone else monitoring shot spotter social media or actually bringing up ongoing police calls that are happening right now so if a call comes over the radio we can actually pick that up look at it on our police server software which is tied into the department and get more information about the crime and we also have Brian O'Rourke here, who's an intern. He's, he's helping us out. Uh, we try to use interns throughout the city extensively, and they help us tremendously. This program is called Geophedia, and basically what this does is it takes the public social media and brings it into one platform. So anybody that knows what they're looking for can actually find this, but what this does, it drills it down for us, where we could set up a geofence around an area. So again, say the St. Patrick's Day Parade. We could set up that fence and people use different things like Periscope where they can take a phone and they can live stream footage onto the internet. What this does is it shows that somebody is doing it and we actually pick up crimes in progress or say a fight that may be on video that somebody's sending out prior to it even being dispatched. And we, we were able to get that in here and then send people on the air right to the incident location. So I know this is something that comes up a lot, particularly around gang activity. A lot of the gang members amazingly communicate with each other, brag with, to each right. other, taunt each other uh, using social media that the police potentially or anybody else have access to looking at. Can you just, how does this feed into that capability and that kind of monitoring? Well, the other things we can do is we can put in keywords, and if anybody tweets, Facebooks, any of these, you know, Picasso, Flickr, Instagram, they mention anything like gun, bomb, shooting, we can put those words in. It will automatically pick it up, filter it out, and we can, we can actually read it. If anything's in a different language, it will automatically translate it. Wow. Um, and it does it, you know, it's live. Now, some normal law-abiding citizens on their Facebook and they're sending their kid a, a message, this isn't something that you're monitoring. No. Um, it, it strictly is within a defined area, maybe because there's a parade or an event going on for a limited period of time, and you're looking for, like you say, these key words that might suggest that there's something you know, yep. that, that we want to be on top of. And we can also use it in investigations. So, you know, we've had a bunch of recent terrorist attacks, even the, um, the one in California, where the actual suspects were using social media. Well, we can go back and, and find that. Mm -hmm. And again, that was in Arabic. We can actually translate it, read it in here as to what is going on, 
and then bring in more resources if we believe it's an actual threat. Wow. I, I, th I think people think of the FBI and, you know, those kind of law enforcement agencies having that capability, but I don't think everybody appreciates that's something we have right here. In right, and again, this is all open public, source. Yeah. It's, it's nothing, you know, you don't need a search warrant, a subpoena, or yeah. anything like that. It's all open source information. Um, you know, everybody's kids are, you know, tweeting out different things, and yeah. it's a good example. I bring people up here on tours, and I tell the younger kids, look it, this is up here. Whatever you send out there, people can see. Yeah. So it's also a, you know, a teaching thing. Yeah. For adolescents coming up, that this is all stuff that's out in the public. Yeah. No, that that's that's an important thing to remind people in this uh, internet age with all the different platforms and social media vehicles that uh, people should be very conscious about what they're sharing. Right. You know. uh, well, I want to thank Captain uh, Paul Saucier for all the great information, the great job that he's doing here, and, and really. On behalf of, I think, all the citizens of Worcester, thank the Worcester Police Department for the great job they're doing on keeping our city safe. Uh, and I think we're all reassured to know that they have all of the latest tools uh, to do their job. And I want to thank all of you for watching, uh, educating yourself about how your city works, how your taxpayer dollars uh, are working for you, making our community better. Until next time.